This is MJ. I love Star Wars and I want to welcome you to my fully operational analysis of The Mandalorian. Mandalorian Season 2 is coming up and I've decided that I'm going to be revisiting The Mandalorian. I'm starting with Chapter 1, which is titled The Mandalorian. Chapter 2 is titled The Child, so on and so forth. I will uh, mention those as I do. So, like I said, I recently watched this and I was very impressed by it. I uh, <laughs> I wanted to see if Mandalorian was going to hold up, and I enjoyed season one. It took me a little bit of time to, to watch it, probably. Uh, actually, I, it's funny, I did drop off, and I watched the first three or four, then things happened, and there were a lot of things getting in my way, and it took me a while to finally get back to watching it, uh, until I did, and I thoroughly enjoyed it when I did. And... Uh, I want to see how that pans out as I go through it again. Uh, there's going to be full spoilers for the show if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, let me just give you a little spoiler. It's pretty great as far as I remember. If I end up thinking differently, uh, that'll be interesting. But it's pretty great. I think it's probably the best thing that Disney has done with Star Wars since the purchase in, uh, I don't know, whenever that was, 2012? Is that how long it's been? I don't know. Anyway, I think it's the best thing that they've done. And I'm even a big fan of The Last Jedi. Uh, and you can, you know, fight me about that if you want to. But anyway, um, yeah, I think The Mandalorian is better. It's better than everything. This first episode made me care more about uh, The Mandalorian and his culture and, <clears throat> excuse me, his story than, you know, three movies did about any of the main characters introduced in those. And, uh, that's a lot. <laughs> That's saying a lot, especially because I think this thing was only 30 to 40 ep uh, minutes long. So anyway, uh, I like uh, one of the things I like about the show about the Mandalorian is the Mandalorian himself and how much he is uh, very much a man of action. He's extremely silent. He has I wrote down his lines uh, in prep for this, and uh, I think he has maybe 10 to 12 lines. And there was probably six memorable ones, and some of them were just, whoa, wait, hold on, that kind of thing. You know, don't blow yourself up <laughs> um, to IG-11. And uh, anyway, it's interesting because what he chooses to say and the context that he's put in tell a lot of the story about him. And I think it's interesting that he's mostly a silent protagonist. Anybody who's uh, familiar with video games, you know, Link, Mario, characters like that, uh, they are silent protagonists. Of course, you've got your, you know, whatever, more advanced, more adult, um, or more mature, but, but not in that way. Uh, like Morrowind, Elder Scrolls, that kind of thing. You have those silent protagonists, too. Um, but it's a little different. But it's odd to me that, uh, or it was interesting to me to see how they were going to have this guy who doesn't show his face, who hardly speaks, uh, how he was going to emote and how he was going to get in different situations. And really the action that he shows... Um, the actions that he takes really show who his character is. But, um, like when he's in the fight trying to rescue or really find, uh, capture his bounty, uh, he does talk a lot more. He talks to, uh, IG-11, and on his way there, he also talks to Quill, or, you know, Quill. Yeah, that's who he is. So it's funny, they, uh, they don't give names. Like, you don't learn the Mandalorian's actual name until, um, many episodes in, like maybe episode six. Uh, you don't learn Quill's name until maybe the same episode, uh, so it's kind of funny. Um, but it, while I was watching it, there were little things that happened, like uh, after Mando gets his uh, his pauldron, you see him in a ship, and the shot is repeated where we're in the cockpit behind him, on the right side of him as he's you know flying, and we had seen that shot before, but this time it was different. Uh, I don't know if he was wearing the cape earlier or not, but the cape becomes more prominent in my view uh, after he gets the pauldron, and the pauldron kind of pops there as he's sitting in the seat. So it's not that he's transformed entirely, there's just this small change to him, and we saw it being paired with the forging of his pauldron and the flashbacks to him as an orphan, or you know, really as a child, to parents and being orphaned, so his parents must have been killed, um, you know, not too far from him before he was found. Uh, and he calls himself a foundling. Um, so anyway, it was just really interesting. It was, there's a lot of like silence 
and subtlety to it and you get to just kind of be there and sit and dwell in this galaxy far far away and it's really entertaining to watch um other characters get to like share expository dialogue like the guy he captures in the beginning he keeps asking questions he keeps throwing little tidbits out there and even though mando doesn't respond to them they're sufficient to give you uh, information about the universe and i think that was really clever that you have all these people talking and you have them being in this variety of situations which leads to the audience learning a lot about him and a lot about the state of the galaxy because uh, they don't even say like there's no titles on planets telling when uh, or where they are and there's no like express exposition there's no crawl it's just you're dropped right into the middle of this thing and it's another day in the Mandalorian's life and you learn about things with him which I think raises the level of interest it raises it raises the um, not the suspense or mystery really because that's a <laughs> that's a silly thing to chase. And like I know all the secrets of Mandalorian or of the Mandalorian so far, season one, and I was still gripped and excited, and I found it all to be very interesting and enjoyable to watch. So there's I don't know. There's I almost think it's funny because you wouldn't think it is with such a silent protagonist, but this is a very character-driven show and we get exposed to who the Mandalorian is, what his life is like, what struggle he's involved with, um, like the restoration of his people that was kind of mentioned by the Imperial guy, um, played by Werner Herzog, I don't know why I know that. Um, uh, but like, we get that his people are like, lost, and they're floundering, and they're trying to find their way back. And the Beskar that he has, um, that he has acquired, it's going to be valuable to other foundlings, um, I, well, yeah, I think to make their helmets, because they wear helmets from when they're young, which is something we'll discover together if you're following along with me as I'm um, going through the show again. Um, and, uh, anyway, like, the Imperial guy's like, yeah, you know, things, the natural order should be restored, shouldn't it? And, of course, for him, the natural order is probably the Empire, which grew out of the Republic, in his opinion, maybe probably righteously, and, you know, now there's this, you know, terrible rebellion of these upstarts who are disrupting the natural order just like Mandalore was disrupted from its natural order and like the Empire had pulled in these Mandalorians like anyway there's interesting context I know from watching like Rebels and Clone Wars about the Mandalorian but like his situation is so different and this post Return of the Jedi world is um, different from that and it's unique uh, but without dumping exposition I get to learn about the world and uh, I enjoy that a lot. It's kind of like the original Star Wars. Yeah, you had the opening crawl, but like you didn't know what a power converter was. You didn't know what a T-16 Skyhopper was. You didn't know uh, what all the, you know, the Imperial Academy and all these things. But like through the dialogue, through the characters living their normal lives and not doing the, as you know, um, you got to learn a lot about it. And you got to be interested in different things. Like uh, I'm interested in this, uh, um, the Forger lady or... Uh, not forger. She's a weapons forger, but whatever. Um, and like, there seems to be, I, I'm interested in like the Beskar and like, you know, how it's used and like how, you know, thin the armor is, but how strong it is. It just, there's like a bunch of super interesting little tidbits in there along with interesting stuff going on with the characters. So like, um, we get a couple lines, like the Mandalorian doesn't want to ride with a droid. He doesn't trust him. Then IG-11, he kind of huffs at having to work with IG-11, and he's irritated with him, you know, and that's something we're going to see expanded upon more later. Um, and I like that that stuff's already being set up now, and it makes sense. And he says so little that what he says carries meaning with it, but it also leaves doors open for things to develop in an interesting way. Uh, like, he, he could be bugged with droids because they're, you know, not as capable as uh, sentience or, or, you know, organics or whatever, but... It doesn't really say. But uh, anyway, I feel like if... Oh, oh yeah. I'm, I'm going to wrap up soon because I don't really have much more to say. Um, there's neat stuff like that ice monster. Uh, like the walrus alligator thing coming up and like attacking the guy. And that was like a funny moment where the guy was like, Oh, you guys better be careful. And the the fish dude was like, Hey, do you think this is real? you think there's any, really anything to worry about? And then the guy gets killed. Um, you know, too bad for him. But yeah, it was a great comedic moment for the story. Um, and then... Mando just goes out there with his rifle and, like, you know, tases the thing off until it goes away, which was pretty cool to see. 
Uh, like I love the little nods to stuff like the carbon freezing chamber that he was using for him. And um, I didn't realize this at first, I feel like an idiot now, uh, but that's and probably because it's all beat up though and stripped of its, you know, paint or whatever. But that's like uh, a clone trooper command or it's like a clone trooper dropship or whatever. I had no idea those were called Razor Crests. I don't know how long that's been called that. I like the Jedi and I like the force and the spiritual stuff from Star Wars, not so much the ships, but you know, some of them are cool, I guess. Um, but that was really neat. I got to say, one of my favorite aspects or parts of the episode and something that really pulled me in was, one, uh, the Mandalorian score. Very, very good. Excellent, excellent work. Uh, I was really impressed by it. Like, the whole, like, when it was used, it was used to fantastic effect. Um, but there's this scene with the, um, Gerbers, not Pergil, Pergil are the space whales. Um, the Blurgs. The scene with the Blurgs, the taming of the Blurg. Uh, that we got to see was super interesting. So Quill tells him like, hey, your people used to ride the mythosaurs. Like, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to, you know, ride one of these beasts and, you know, make this Blurg Mount yours. And, uh, you know, you're going to need to uh, ride her to get to where we need you to get. And, like, you're fully capable of this. Uh, let's make it happen. Let's, let's see it. And the music changes, which is a little bit bad. Uh, maybe, because it, you know, emotionally man manipulates you into feeling more sensitive. But the music changes, the way the camera, uh, the direction of the shot or the scene changes, and there's like a softness and a gentleness to uh, Mando. And I don't know if that opens him up to not killing or murdering the child at the end of the episode or not, but it feels like, it felt like a mystical moment, him connecting with this animal who had tried to kill him and who he had tried to kill before. Maybe it is intentional and mystical and spiritual. Um, and he stops and he <sighs> learns to approach it in a different way. He takes a different approach. He forces himself to take a different approach. And in so doing, he's able to um, break through to it. And he's able to uh, finally connect with it. And then he's able to tame the Blurg mount and he uses it to, uh, you know, do his thing and he's successful he reaches i think there's like i think it's like this mini arc where he can't do it and then he does it um because he walks down a different path he takes himself in a different direction and it ultimately opens up him up to not murdering the foundling child or abandoned child that he you know is gonna protect from ig11 at least i don't want to be spoiler even though it's dumb that it's i'm trying not to be spoilery as much as i can as I go through, but it'll get increasingly more spoilery as I uh, talk about different episodes. So anyway, the action was great. The music was great. I really enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, and uh, I can't wait to talk about more, or watch more episodes and talk about more of them to see what I think as it goes along. Um, I think Grief Cargo was really cool. Uh, he feels different this time going through, a little bit different, but I like it. He feels very wary of the world and like I like the little thing about the fact that he was trying to use the imperial credits and then he had to use the Kelmari Fawn instead and just uh, I don't know I just like that fun kind of real worldy type stuff that's in there and uh, like all the little extra conflicts that get made and then like I don't know like the dumb comment about the the bathroom in the beginning when the guy's trying to figure out a way to escape before he gets captured um, I don't know lots of fun um, I don't have much else to say so I'm going to go ahead and stop now, and I'm going to ask you to look forward to more of these. Uh, I plan to get the other seven episodes of this out before uh, Mandalorian Season 2 starts, which is going to be October 30th, and then hopefully uh, every week I'll have, um, a day or two later, a uh, review and analysis, a uh, little discussion with myself about the episode up and uh, ready for you to hear. And uh, yeah, that's about it. If you enjoyed this, like, comment, and share to help me grow. Don't forget to subscribe to keep current with each release. Chat with me on Twitter at MJ underscore scribe. Visit MJMunoz.com slash podcast to find the multiple feeds in which I analyze Star Wars, Tokusatsu, comics, and more. Visit MJMunoz.com slash support for links to my Redbubble and coffee pages to help me out. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Until next time, be well, and remember... In balance lies power to see through dark and walk in light.